Hello, everyone. I'm Betty Hurley Dasgupta, and I'm here with my co facilitator, Carol Yeager, of uh, the MOOC, the CMOOC VizMath. And we're very happy to have uh, you with us today. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Um, we still aren't seeing enough tweets, so please, uh, when you have a chance, uh, share your tweet with hashtag VizMath. There's also a um, Facebook group that you can join called VizMath a CMOOC. And uh, please also, if you've not done so already, uh, register for our MOOC. And um, the site for that is at math.cdlprojects.com. We're very happy today to have Allison Snikis uh, talking to us about visualizing data through graphs. And uh, to prepare for her presentation, we actually had a contest in which we asked for people to either submit confusing graphs or graphs that they thought were impressive visualizations of data. And our winner is a confusing graph. And we actually have uh, the person who submitted it uh, here. So I'm going to ask her to talk a bit about it. It's Alexandria Robeson. Um, hi, I'm Alexandria. This kind of shows the amount of cheese produced around the world. Um, the United States produces about 25% of the world's cheese, and it um, just breaks down, as you can see with the color coding on the sides, um, how much other places in the world are producing cheese. Thanks, Alexandria. Um, the, the other thing that uh, is not too easy to read here about this graph that's kind of interesting is that the rest of the world, I think, is 45%. Uh, so um, did, what did you think of this graph? Um, I really liked it because I am a big fan of cheese. So I just thought it was an interesting graph um, that I, it, you can't really read it now very well, but I just thought it was an interesting graph because I like cheese. <laughs> Thank you. OK. So um, the, the, the next graph is uh, one that was submitted as an impressive graph. And the website is on the bottom because this is also uh, difficult to read. Um, uh, and the site is great examples of data visualization. And this particular one is a screen uh, saver. Uh, showing the uh, what's going on in blogs in real time, um, and that this site had a, a lot of uh, very interesting visualizations of all sorts of of uh, data available from the internet. So uh, you should take a look. And now we're going to move to um, Allison's presentation, and uh, very appreciative that Allison is taking the time to uh, present to us today. And um, Allison, please continue. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Snigus. Um, I thought maybe I'd start, I can do a little introduction just sort of quickly about my experience, what the sorts of things I do. Um, related to statistics, um, I guess there's sort of three places I work. Uh, one is I uh, teach a beginning statistics course at the School of Education at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And um, it's for master's students. And most of the students who take the course uh, don't have a recent or strong background in math. And so it's not, you know, so um, it's at a very beginning level. We take our time and really work through things and really study this, the, the very basics, making sure that people have the kinds of uh, hands-on activity. Because when you study statistics, actually making the graphs, doing the data analysis is really a big piece of the place where you uh, can learn a lot. Um, I work here, that's where I am today, at Princeton Learning Cooperative during the day. And uh, this is a learning center for high schoolers and some middle schoolers who have come out of school. School maybe wasn't a good fit for them. Um, or maybe they wanted something else besides the kinds of things that a regular public school or private school would offer. And um, so we offer a way for, basically a way for them to homeschool. Um, as the homeschooling laws in in, uh, in the United States are are uh, reasonably 
they facilitate, so not every country has that, but basically they facilitate the idea that um, uh, high schoolers and you know teens can come out of school and can learn and uh, have an education through their high school before they move on to whatever they're going to do after high school. And so I work here with, uh, with kids who have come out of school. And I teach statistics here, so uh, right now I have three students in my uh, introductory statistics class. I use the Open Learning Initiative um, Statistics and Probability course to do that, which if we have time at the end, maybe I'll show you a little bit of the course in case you were interested. It's free and open and available for people to use uh, for uh, independent learning. Um, and the other place that I work, and this is how I know Betty, um, is uh, with Wiki Educator. Um, I've been working with Wiki Educator now. I think it's maybe three, going on three years, maybe going on four years. I'm not sure. Um, I do a number of different things there. Uh, I've done a lot of work on statistics. My hope is that um, maybe someday there would be a whole deep. Um, sort of repository of statistics content available through Wiki Educator. And Wiki Educator works kind of like Wikipedia in that you can access what you want and it would be really wonderful to have, you know, some sort of really nice free and open um, statistics material that both students could work through on their own maybe, but also that instructors could use in various ways for classroom learning. Um, I also help, right now I'm helping with the creation of an art appreciation course. And this is really just taking something that's already open and available online and moving it to Wiki Educator to make it, um, to, to sort of reorganize it and uh, clean it up in some ways in terms of its uh, learning design. And I also do a lot of what we call gardening, which um, I, I help keep the spam, so I get rid of spam stuff. I block people and um, I categorize things according to categories that we want to do or, you know, just generally help around when I see the need for various things that uh, people need help with. Um, so that's my introduction. Um, a note before I get started is just sort of on copyright. Um, my work in Wiki Educator has really just helped me understand that um, and really come to believe that knowledge is something that should be free and that so often um, the knowledge and the content for the educational process is under copyright laws and it doesn't allow teachers and instructors to use it in fully in the way that we really want to, especially now with the internet because it used to be we could own a book and share it with students and we could do things in the classroom. But now on the internet we have to be more careful because we can't really, it's not okay to use copyrighted stuff, you know, on the internet and make it available. Um, just generally out there. So, so I've put some statements here. The content here is a Creative Commons licensed, share alike, and uh, and I've also I've indicated what software I've used for making the graphs. And in both cases, they have uh, open licenses. I do actually use other statistical software, but um, I, I thought it would be nice to sort of demonstrate how you can use open source software to do a lot of things that you want in statistics. Um, okay, so uh, moving ahead, I don't know if there's, should, should I ask if there's any questions or at any point? I guess people will raise their hand if, uh, if I, I guess that's the point. If, if you have a question or anything, um, if you'd like to uh, raise your hand. Um, and I will certainly turn off my mic and uh, then you can ask a question. All right, so I'll go ahead and move ahead. Um, I thought it'd be useful to start with the building box. So my idea here is to just really begin at the very beginning of how you think about the data that's going to go into the graph. So we looked at a pie chart. The other graph I'm not so sure, I'm not sort of um, familiar with how to do sort of geographical graphs and things, but the very first pie chart, you know, there's data that sits behind that. And I thought it'd be interesting if we start at the data point and then work out into some of the various kinds of graphs that might be considered depending on the kind of data that you have. Um, so the first idea is really what is data and numerical facts about individuals, cases, or subjects. And um, it, data forms the real basis, the, the uh, the underpinning. So every time you look at a graph, no matter where it is, Time Magazine or on the internet or you know in a newspaper or wherever, there's always typically a data set that sits back there because data is organized into a data set and uh, it's the basic information that's used to create that visual 
And I would say in every instance, that visual behind it is some sort of large or small, depending. But they can, they can get very big, you know, 20,000, 100,000 case data set um, or larger, you know, that sits behind these graphs. And I just thought it might be interesting to look at that at the beginning. And inside a data set, there's basically two kind, there's two sort of features that are important. One is there's the variables, and these are the measurable characteristics of the individual, the thing that you're measuring. So in the cheese graph, they were measuring people's um, I'm not exactly sure, actually, interest in cheese or like of cheese or how much they eat cheese. They're measuring something about their affinity for cheese. And we'll look at variables. So you'll be able to see a number of them, what I mean. And the other piece um, is individuals. Uh, and these are the objects being measured. Um, they could be people. They could be other living things, trees, animal populations. It could be objects, furniture, chairs, coffee cups, you know, all kinds of things might serve as the individuals. I tend to use the word individual. I work in the um, graduate school of education, so we mostly talk about psychological type things. I don't work in the engineering side of statistics, so I don't measure furnaces and, you know, engineering type things like that, cars and, and things like that. Um, one other thing I can say about variables, stepping back a minute, is um, they, they, you might think about these characteristics as sort of two kinds, things that are very clearly measured, like temperature or age or a test score. Um, but there's also attributes that are measured just as much, but you might not think about them as being measured, such as maybe something like uh, male-female. Um, is certainly a kind of variable, so gender is a variable. The years of education. You might not think about this, the idea that you measure a person's years of education. Um, so these would, we'll, we'll talk about these sort of types of variables and how they play into some of the decisions that, that are made in, uh, in graphing and in statistics, generally speaking. Okay, so looking at a data set. Um, this is a particular data set that I picked out of uh, R. Now, R is just the capital letter R, and it's a statistical software that's open source software um, available for download. If you just go to uh, R, if you Google R project, pretty straightforward to find it. You can download it. It's available for Apple, Mac, um, Unix systems. Um, very powerful. Lots of statisticians use it. So, uh, really nice uh, piece. And the, the idea is that all of their data is also open source. So that it's openly licensed with the uh, GNU um, general public license. So I don't have to worry about whether I'm using copyrighted data and showing something that really belongs to somebody else all the way down the line. And so I went ahead and I just I picked a data set out of there. I have to say it's not all that interesting of a data set, but nonetheless I think it um, will demonstrate some of the characteristics and things that are that are, form the basis for graphing. So there's 237 uh, students in the data set. They, they were Statistics 1 students. They're from the University of Adelaide in Australia. I don't really know much else about the data set, sadly. Usually I like to know more, and we'll talk about that um, in a minute. Um, so what you can notice right away about this is the variables are organized in the columns. Um, it looks like a spreadsheet. Right? Okay, so this is actually the way R presents their data. Um, but if you worked in Excel spreadsheet or in uh, SPSS or SAS, you know, it would also look like a data, like a spreadsheet. And the variables are in the, in the columns. And the individuals, the people, are in the rows. So each row represents uh, an individual person in this case or, you know, an individual case or subject, um, generally speaking. Um, so let's just look at the, uh, the values of the variables for the first person in this case in the, uh, in the, uh, in the um, data set. So we can see that there's sex, their gender, as two choices, male and female, and that they're female. The next variable is fold, and in fact this is a measure of whether they put their right arm on their left when they fold their arms, or whether they put their left arm on their right when they fold their arms, or whether it's really neither. And um, so there's three choices. So it's about folding your arms. So if you could just try right now, we decide which side to fold your arms on. I, do, I definitely do left on right. Um, Carol, Carol says left on right over there too, yeah. Uh, 
Okay, the third variable is a uh, pulse, and uh, as you can see, uh, the first person has a pulse of 92. The fourth uh, individual in the data set is blank, and so that would be missing data. Um, and we will talk. A it, it'll come up as you'll see a little bit later. The fourth variable is age, so the first person is 18.25 years. Um, and interestingly, you know, often when you say your age, you just say your age in years and forget about the months. But they clearly have collected uh, information about how long it's been since their last birthday. So it's the age in years, but they trans translated the months into, uh, into years there. Um, clap is, again, sort of uh, do you clap with your left hand on top, with your right hand on top, or neither, just sort of straight together. I, I've practiced this back and forth. I can't decide which way I do it. I don't know how I would actually actually answer this if it asked. Um, the next one is exercise. Uh, whether you do some, uh, frequently some or none are the options. And the next one was smoking. And it's never, occasionally, regularly, and heavy, which actually doesn't occur for any of the first 10 people. So there's other actual variables in this data set, but you know, just thought that I'd give you a sense of what a data set might look like. And this is you know, really pretty typical for what you might see in a data set. Um, one other thing I can say is that often, the nice thing about R is that it can you can label the values in your data set, and then it displays it that way labeled. So this data set, in actual fact, I'm not sure which it is, but I think female is coded as 1 and male is coded as 2. But here you actually just look at the words female and male. And that's really nice because when you look at the data set you have some sense of what's going on there instead of it just looking like a bunch of numbers. Um, uh, so we're going to be moving then into talking about graphing. Um, and uh, graphs are part of the one of the first steps in statistics called exploratory data analysis. And we use that to help us understand the data. The very it's actually the second step. The very first step in statistics or statistical research is to, is to collect the data. Um, and, but that's a whole other topic. And so once you've collected the data and you have your data set, the next topic is exploratory data analysis. And but we're really just going to talk about the graphing side of that, not so much the producing of the statistics, the descriptive statistics that go with it. But certainly it's going to come up. I'll probably mention some. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm just checking the chat. Yes, uh, now for another time, what is correlated with crossing arm behavior, if anything? Well, yes, I went and looked around a little bit of that. So uh, I don't know that I found anything, sadly. Okay, um, just talking a little bit more about data. Um, as I indicated, it really always exists with a real world context. And so that's why I made sure that you understand there's 237 uh, students in that data. Uh, they're, for, they're statistics one students at a university in, um, in Australia. And that matters. Um, so it's that context that matters. And uh, I'm not sure why that data set was collected. Um, probably it was just collected to have some data so they could mess around with you know, uh, analyzing it. But no matter. Um, typically, data is collected to uh, answer questions. And so you'll have a particular question in mind, and you'd like to get some information about that. Um, you, you also, when you do that, you're thinking about a particular population. So uh, for instance, there's a, a large effort uh, that's made in the United States to collect data on 12 to 17-year-olds. Um, it's the Center for Alcohol and Substance Abuse at Columbia University, I believe. And uh, they make a very large effort. They had a data set that had 1,003 students that uh, randomly sampled from across the United States who are 12 to 17 year olds and then asked them uh, a lot of questions. Well, they're looking to answer questions about alcohol and substance abuse not just for those 1,000 students in the sample, but for actually the whole population of 12 to 17 year olds in the United States. And so, um, so we're always interested typically in some larger population, and that's this idea of what population are we interested in. And that's going to drive how we collect that data so that you can answer that question in a, in a larger population. Um, other things we want to know is who exactly are the individuals that are in the data set. 
Um, and this would be the particular sample. Um, who are they? How were they chosen? How many are there? Um, you, you, you want as much information about the individuals as you can get. And then you also want very clear information about the variables. So what are the variables? But you want to be very clear about the definition for each of those variables and then how the variables were obtained. How are they measured? There's lots of ways to measure things. And one example that's come up in my class this, uh, this semester is we had a variable for um, the uh, number of students or you know whether yeah, the number of days absent for students in a high school and the number of days attending. And you would think that they would be mirrors of each other. And so when we put up, we had been looking at the days absent, and then we went and put up the days attending, and it was not a mirror at all. And it was just like, geez, I didn't know there was some other option besides absent and attending. And clearly there was. I had not measured those variables, and I didn't know how they were measured. But it really mattered. I couldn't really use it in any uh, real way because they didn't go together. And so knowing how the variables are measured is really critical. Knowing how they're defined, you know, what are the values that are possible for that variable is really very critical in, in, in terms of uh, trying to interpret the results. All right. so. Uh, we can move ahead and I'm um, going to go back to this uh, um, data set picture of the uh, uh, Statistics 1 students. And um, let's talk about the idea of there's two basic kinds of variables. There's actually more than this kinds of variables, but this is a good place to start if you're beginning to understand this, categorical versus quantitative variables. And um, categorical just means that it classifies each individual into a category. So it looks like it's categorical category. Um, quantitative um, suggests that there's a numerical value or measurement for each individual. So you're measuring something about each individual in the data set. And so if we look across these, you can quickly pick out the ones that are categorical that just sort of put a person into a uh, category. So that would be sex and fold and clap and exercise and smoke. And then pulse and age would be uh, quantitative variables. And uh, really pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, as I said before, in actually in this data set, the, uh, the sex variable is coded as a 1 and a 2. It's just displayed here with the label. Um, and you have to be careful, because sometimes you'll look at a variable and you'll be like, Hmm, it looks like numbers there, so it must be uh, quantitative. Well, just because there's numbers doesn't mean those numbers, those numbers could be being used as a label to say what category that variable is in. Um, so sometimes 0 or 1 is used as whether you know, something's present or not present. It has nothing to do with zeroness or oneness. So uh, another way to think about it is quantitative variables um, are variables that uh, you can do math on. And it would make sense. Of course, you could you could do math on categorical variables that had numbers, but it wouldn't make any sense. Quantitative variables are ones where you can average them or you know uh, do math on them, and it, and it would make sense. So, uh, okay. So uh, moving ahead, we're gonna we're gonna start with talking about categorical variables to begin with. Um, and my first data display is not a graph at all. In fact. Uh, we call this a frequency distribution, uh, sort of the fancy name for it. And I'm sure you've seen plenty of these. They're widely used in lots of media and lots of places. Um, uh, so um, in terms of this frequency distribution, some just general points about it. First of all, I like to put titles on things. I think that's just really an important habit to get into when you're young. So when I teach high schoolers and the graduate students, they're not, not particularly young. But um, you know, I really emphasize the need for uh, putting titles on. And sometimes people think, well, I know what it is. But you know, as soon as you move it from in front of you to in front of somebody else, really, if I presented this without the title, you wouldn't really have any any idea. Frequently, some none. What you know? What does that refer to? So, titling is really very important. Um, and being as clear as possible. I'm not so sure this is uh, the the best title. I didn't say there were statistics one students. Maybe that would be useful. I don't know. 
Anyway, so this is the exercise variable, and you can see it's categorical. It has three values, frequently sum and none, and that displays the count um, for each of those values and the percent for each of those values. And in creating this frequency distribution, I didn't run it in any statistical package. I just typed it in, actually, in, I got the numbers from a stat thing, but I didn't like the way their frequency distribution displayed. So I took the numbers and typed them into a spreadsheet. Um, and But in doing so, I had to be careful. I had to make sure that the numbers line up correctly. So under count and under percent, the units need to line up, the tens need to line up, the hundreds need to line up. In the percent, you need the decimals to line up. And that's really pretty important. You can't just center these in the column. You know, that's something that you maybe sometimes don't think about when you display something like this. How the formatting has to make sense and it has to look right in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of the presentation and the, so people can interpret it correctly. I also had to think about how to, uh, what should be the, in the top row, the second row, and the third row. And I decided that the best situation in this case would be because these categories are already ordered frequently, some, none. It goes from the most to the least. These already have a sort of innate order. So it seemed most reasonable to order them from either the most to the least or the least to the most either way. Um, I could have, however, uh, ordered them by count, by percent would have been the same. Um, and that might make sense. So, so for instance, so, so I think this does a pretty nice job. I ordered because that those values have an innate order, I naturally order them. But it, let's say they were countries, um, and let's say you had you know 15 different countries and you were measuring the poverty rate or something in those countries. If I were to order th those, those countries aren't going to have any sort of natural order. Right. Um, another natural order might be alphabetically, and I could put the countries alphabetically in that order. But that would mean that the, let's say we had a poverty rate, which is sort of like a, you know, so it's not really a count or a percent in that sense. It is a percent, but whatever, in a sense. Um, you know, that, that rate would be all over the place. You'd have high numbers and low numbers and high numbers and low numbers sort of all mixed together. So in that situation, I wouldn't order it by al alphabetically. I would order it by the value that you're displaying. Um, so the poverty rate, I would put it in numerically probably from the most to the least, uh, but maybe from the least to the most, depending on what point I want to make, and would order it in that sense and not order the countries alphabetically. And so those are just giving you a sense of, of some of the different choices that go into, you know, the design of the display. So even in something as simple as this. Um, okay, uh, so I think that's a um, you know, and the reason I started with this is because I want to compare this display with actually graphing this data. It's very simple data, but you see this kind of simplicity, this, this sort of simple graph pretty often, or a very simple, you know, three category pie chart or a bar chart, um, you know, pretty often. And I wonder how, how much more those graphs really supply. And so I thought maybe it would be useful to start here and then maybe compare back as we go forward. Um, Okay, so this is that exact data that I had shown before in a bar graph. And this bar graph was made in R. Um, this is the title that uh, R puts on it. Um, I'm not so happy about this title. I could have done better. I student responses to how often they exercise, N equals 237. Yeah, what students from where, you know, what's, what's the point of this? So um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that I, I particularly like the title. Um, Anyway, uh, let's, let's talk about some strengths first in terms of the display of the data here. Um, it's clear and concise. It's, you know, it's easy to read. It gets the point across. Frequently is clearly the largest value. None is much smaller than both of the other two. Some is more similar to frequently than it is to none. And so it's very clear. You can see, you know, and there's not a lot of color sort of Sometimes if there's too much color, it sort of takes away from what the information that's trying to be conveyed. Um, it does include a title, so you know, it does give some context. Um, and it provides a count on the bar. You know, that might not be all that interesting. This is a, such a simple 
situation, you know, maybe not all that interesting here, but just the idea that you could you could put a count on bars so that uh, if that if the differences were subtle, you might not be able to see the differences on the scale. And so having a count related to the bar might be useful. Um, as I said, the weaknesses I don't think the title is very uh, explanatory, um, and the labeling on the x-axis uh, very weak. Exer. Um, I failed to uh, relabel that exer. That was the name of the variable in the data set, and I failed to relabel it as the full name exercise. I could have done that. And then the freak uh, is just is uh, uh, you know frequently I could have actually written that out. So you know that's not so great. But I think the biggest weakness here is the order of the of the bars. Um, notice that the order is alphabetical. So F N S. It's alphabetical left to right, and uh, not you know that's it doesn't really help us think about what's really going on because we have to in our brains rearrange it. Okay, frequently is the highest, sums next, and then none. Um, it would be much better if this were organized in a in a different order. Um, yeah. So an alphabetical. I see Betty just said ah yes the order ah al alphabetical. Um, that's very typical for uh, stat software packages to just do it alphabetically because they don't know what other order. And almost always there's deep options that are hard to get to and you find it down there and you can reorder them. I didn't go that deep because I kind of wanted to show you know, how you know, small things can make sort of larger differences. Um, yeah, so John just said, or reverse order, starting with none. Yeah, you could start with none and then some freak. But in any case, there is a natural innate order in these, and so that would be nice to display. Um, okay, so uh, moving on, let's take a look at a pie chart. And I made these pie charts with LibreOffice Calc, which uh, comes with uh, Ubuntu, uh, is the operating system that uh, I use it. But it's, you know, uh, open office, the same idea as open office Calc. It's available for lots of different. Um, it's available for uh, Apple computers and uh, Windows computers, etc. Um, it's a free download. Okay, so pie charts. Uh, these are used to display counter percents um, in each category, not unlike a bar chart. You know, sort of the same basic idea. Um, but one thing about a pie chart to keep in mind is that they're only useful when you have all the categories of the whole thing. Um, and so if we think back to the pie chart of the cheese, um, actually maybe I'll just go back to it because it's kind of interesting. Um, we can just go back quickly. Cheese here. Oops, that's too far. Cheese. Okay. Um, we can't, we have to have that other slice. So the little, um, the light can slice has to be there. We can't make a pie chart that just has United States, Germany, France, Italy, Netherlands because that's not the whole thing, unless you define the whole thing to be just those countries. So if some, somehow you could say all of the countries that something, you know, if there's something that they are just, they make up the whole thing, then you could just put them in. But otherwise, you, you, a pie chart, you have to include all the things that make up the whole. And so um, that, that's kind of a critical thing. You don't need to do that with bar graphs. So for instance, um, if you wanted to graph uh, the portions of students in four different majors in, um, in a university, you could do that with a bar graph. You could show you know, the portion of students, the number of students in all of these, these uh, majors um, in four, because the university would have many more than four uh, majors. Um, but you couldn't use a pie chart because it wouldn't represent the whole thing. Um, Dividing what pie, yeah. Gary says pie charts are very bad for financial data. Dividing what pie, yeah, I exactly. Uh, what pie is it? Um, okay, so uh, so looking at these two, um, so let's sort of focus on the left-hand one, uh, the upper left one to start. Um, a little bit more descriptive title. That's nice. Um, it's informative. Uh, I like. I like the idea that it includes the count and the percent. Um, I think that's useful um, in lots of situations. If you just want a quick visual, you might not include that. But um, yeah, so I, I think it's, 
it's nice that the colors clearly distinguish the different slices. You don't always see that, and so that's, that's important and needs to be looked at. The other thing is there's not too many slices. Um, and I think I've seen lots of pie charts um, that have just way too many slices. There's just, you can't begin to really evaluate them effectively. Um, now, looking at these comparisons, um, the 3D versus the 2D, um, the issue, there's quite a bit of uh, sort of criticism of 3D graphs. I noticed that the cheese was ever so slightly 3D. Um, and maybe it was okay because ever so slightly. But this is the, um, the sort of the calc option for creating a 3D graph. And the issue is that the extra area of the 3D-ness increases the area of the red and the blue, but it does not increase the area of the yellow in proportion to the red and the blue. So our brains have to undo that. So even though the yellow slice looks the same in both, um, in both of the graphs, um, the blue is significantly bigger and the red is significantly bigger. And so in a sense, it's coming, it's, dis it's distorted and, and our eyes look to the area to um, help us understand this and our brains have to say, but wait a minute, it's only the area on the top that matters that I'm, I'm managing to uh, compare. Um, so, yeah, so 3D, 3D graphs are, are not, um, are criticized pretty oftenly, uh, oftenly, are pretty cr criticized pretty often, um, and it, and it's mostly because it just offers a necessary complication to the data display, and um, generally should be avoided. That's pretty much uh, the thought. Um, pie charts generally, you don't see them used uh, in research to communicate results. You would not, and you know, no matter what journal probably or what research area, subject or area, you know, you just won't see pie charts used there. They are widely used in um, in business, in media, but I would say business, but not finances. But this would, I see a lot, you know. Um, sort of business meeting sort of presentations about how a company's doing and graphs that they've made to sort of demonstrate that. And you see them a lot in mass media, Time and Newsweek magazine and places like that um, have a lot of pie charts. Um, so, you know, have some issues. But, but for three categories, we only have three categories. And um, y you wonder if... Uh, if the frequency distribution doesn't do just as good a job, you know, 48.5% frequently, 41.4% some, and 10% none. And uh, maybe it does just as good a job as any of these visuals would do in terms of uh, clear communication. Yeah, Betty said you see quite a few in the newspapers, exactly, quite a few pie charts in the newspaper. Often I see these 3D ones and it just galls me to see what ends up in the back because the, the slice that's in the back gets short shrift against the slice in the front. So sort of back to my 3D issues. Um, what's, so Alexandria asks, what's the thinking on exploded pies? Um, yeah, the so cheese is an exploded pie chart. So if you are wondering what that example is. Um, I don't know. I've not really read much about um, the exploded pie charts. I can, um, I can see their advantage. There's also donut ones. I saw that in Time Magazine recently. They had a donut pie chart. Um, I don't really know. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the key is that you want to make sure that the, um, that the data is clear and visual. Um, yeah, high so Gary says, high quality graphics can be used to obscure low quality data. Well, there you go. Because really, no matter how good your graph is, um, it all sits down underneath the data. And we're not really talking about data today, so uh, if that is a gigantic point, is that um, having a random sample and some, some of these many topics that we really can't get to today are really the key, um, the, the key to having information that, that should be clearly, that needs to be clearly communicated. Um, I'll spend a little more time on pie charts here in the next slide because um, I find this pretty interesting. Um, 
So one of the issues with pie charts, and this was uh, done uh, with some research uh, into how humans could judge the size of the angle and the area of the slice in the pie chart. Um, and so if you look at A, B, and C, uh, if you look at just the pie charts, wow, you know, like which one's, which one's different? I don't know. I can see that there is some sort of difference, but I'm not really sure where the differences lie. But then when you look at the bar charts underneath, you're like, oh, okay, the first one's ordered, you know, the, you know, so it changes the different proportions for the different colors in the different charts. And um, you can really see how your eye just can't pick those up in the, in the three different pie charts, but yet the bar charts is, is completely clear. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, yeah, so uh, Betty wants to know optimum number of categories. I, I tend to say, you know, uh, if there's more than six, um, consider using a bar graph. Um, I'm not sure where I picked that up. I just found it in my notes when I was preparing for this, and so um, that that, tend, that tends to be what I suggest. I think when you get to be more than six, it gets too confusing, and labeling those tiny little slices can be uh, can be less than useful for communication purposes. Um, and I also think that ordering the uh, slices largest to smallest, starting at the top, actually some people would say even clockwise but I can't get the software necessarily to do it clockwise, so I've adjusted that for myself to be largest to smallest from the top, and, uh, and, uh, and that's helpful. If you want to learn a little bit, if you're interested in some of these other topics about pie charts, I can recommend the Wikipedia article on pie chart. That's where I got this, this uh, particular uh, image, uh, and, um, and it talks a lot about the criticisms of pie charts and kind of interesting. Okay, so... Um, Moving ahead, so that sort of this pie chart then sort of concludes our looking at the display for categorical data. And now if we want to look at quantitative data, uh, we have some more options for how we would uh, display a number of um, options there. So this is a histogram um, and used to display quantitative data. It provides sort of a visual impression of the data, and I've uh, provided here two histograms to sort of demonstrate that. And you can see clearly that they have different shapes. Uh, they have, it, it, you can see where the center of the data is. You have a good sense of the center and a good sense of the spread. And those are sort of the three key factors that uh, are useful when you're looking at a quantitative variable that you want to have some sense of those things. So um, the histogram breaks the data into intervals, and so uh, you can see how each bar covers an interval of data. So you're not able to see the, the um, specifics of the data, so exactly what pulse or age the, uh, the individuals in the data set are is lost in the in the, in the data display, but yet um, you have a good sense of that uh, who is located where in sort of the distribution. So looking at the pulse, um, you can see that the intervals are 10 beats, um, and there's the little scale at the bottom. Um, it looks like a bell-shaped uh, normal distribution. Uh, it's centered around 70 beats per minute. Um, and there doesn't appear to be any sort of uh, outliers or um, points that sit out away from the majority of points. Um, yeah, so Betty says, I'm actually surprised that pulse rate is so symmetric. Um, um, lots and lots of measurements on human beings turn out to when you actually do the measurements to be uh, normal distributions like this. Um, there's, you know, lots of things. You measure lots of things about human beings, as well as uh, some other um, places. So repeated measures of, uh, of any um, sort of physical quality will turn out to be a normal distribution as well. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty common distribution. That's on the left. Um, the age, okay, so this is key. This is the age of Statistics 1 students uh, at the University of Adelaide. If this were the ages of a random sample of people from Australia, we probably wouldn't see a distribution that looks like this. We would maybe see, I don't know, maybe a uniform distribution, whatever. Um, 
But the features, the, the ages of students in a statistics one course, I assume, at the University of Adelaide. Um, the intervals are five, so it's collected uh, the individuals into groups of five. Um, and the issue here is this is a right, it's not an issue, but the, uh, you notice the form, the shape of this distribution is its right skewed distribution. And right skewed just means that most of the data is piled up on the left and it tails off to the right. And so that would make a right skewed. Some people also call that a positively skewed distribution. You'll see that term as well. Um, notice that there's two outliers in this data set. Um, you can't really tell that it's two, but there's some sort of outlier above 70. So in the 70 to 80 range, there appears to be students in the statistics one uh, sample that are over 70 years old. Uh, sort of interesting. Um, so, and there are a fair number of people. There's quite a pile up in the typical place, 17 to, let's say, 22, 23, 24, somewhere around in there. Quite a pile up of data. And then it tails off. You have some older people with two people who are over 70. Kind of interesting. Um, and so this is just very nice. You get a real sense of what the data feels like. Uh, another way to display this uh, uh, this data is would be in a stem and leaf plot. Um, and the way the stem and leaf plot, well, well the, the advantage here is it shows the distribution using the actual values. And so um, the, the stems are the, let's see, maybe I could point. I don't know, the stems are here. Can I, can I point? Uh, maybe not. Uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, so the stems are to the left of the little dashes, and uh, the stems represent the tens place, and the hundreds place in a sense, uh, of the um, of the number, and then the leaves, which are out to the right, represent the units place. And so, to look at this, let's look at the top of pulse rate. You can see that uh, the the smallest value in the pulse variable is 35. And then next up is 40, and then next up is a, there's two values of 48. And looking at the top, there are two values that are 100, and two values that are 104. And so that's how it works. And so these are the actual values of the data. And it's the way it works is that it shows you um, how those uh, what the shape of the distribution would look like, and then you can get a little bit of a sense of the center and the spread. Um, so with the pulse rate, you can see clearly that it looks like some sort of a similar to a normal distribution. Um, and the other advantage here that you don't have in the histogram is you can see the min and max value. So minimum is 35 and the maximum is 104. And so that's useful. Um, age, on the other hand, let's take a look at age. Uh, wow. It uh, doesn't really work here. There was a big pile up, if you remember. The first bar was really tall. Well, those are all the 17 and 18 year olds in the sample. And I, I don't know if you can tell, but I've cut it off over here on the right hand side. It just continued to go up. It went off the page. And so I can't even really display the correct graph here. Um, so it's a big pile up of 17 and 18 year olds. And now we can see here that in the, uh, the 20 year olds, um, I just lost myself. In the 20-year-olds, you have a bunch of 20s, and then some 21-year-olds, some 22, 23, 24-year-olds, um, and there's a pile up there, and then you can see that now those two outliers are actually somebody who's 70 and somebody who's 73. And um, so, you know, you have this... It shows the skewness, but it really doesn't work in this situation um, because it doesn't, you're not able to sort of see all of the data and see sort of where that pileup is. So, um, I stem and leaf plots, you won't ever see these in research papers as well. Um, they're not used for any uh, communication in that sense. They're really mostly useful for getting a quick idea of the shape of a distribution if you had a pencil and paper situation and a small data set. So if you were collecting data, you didn't want to put it into the computer yet, but you wanted to get a sense of what the shape looked like, you could very quickly, you know, create a stem and leaf plot and you could see sort of the center and the shape and the spread in, in, in a nice way. Um, yeah, so yeah, as I said, useful to get an initial impression. Um, 
All right, a box plot is another way to uh, um, display quantitative data. Um, and it provides a visual display here of more the median, the quartiles, the minimax, and the outliers, and in a different sense of things. So uh, let me just go over how this works. So looking at the pulse rate, um, the, the bl black center line is the median. Um, the little dot above it is the mean of the data set. And then the box around that center line represents the 25th percentile on the bottom and the 75th percentile on the top. So basically the box encompasses the middle 50% of the data. Um, and it ranges then, the upper part is above 25%, uh, um, is the top 25% in the distribution and then the lower 25%. And you can see the outliers above and below. Um, so that's nice. Um, interestingly, the, soft, the software has identified some outliers where we didn't really see any in the histogram. Um, in the skewed distribution for age, it all jams up on the bottom because, again, the data is all piled up on the bottom. Um, yeah, I see uh, Betty's note to me, 10 minutes more. Uh, yeah, so that's a box plot um, useful for displaying. So I could probably, so maybe work quickly, see if we have any questions at the end. Um, so in another kind of way of using graphs is to explore relationships. And you're going to have two graphs at once. Sorry, you're going to graph two variables at once. They have to be measures of the two variables for the same set of individuals. So they have to be from one data set. Um, and you might be looking to see if there's any sort of an association, such that knowing the value of one variable tells you something about the other. Um, these are pretty straightforward. Here's a scatter plot. Um, of two variables, height on the x-axis and pulse on the uh, y-axis. And uh, I, I kind of thought that maybe height would predict a person's pulse. And so I went ahead and plotted it. And it doesn't, really, because it's a big ball. It's a big ball of dots. And the, uh, the line through it would be the best fit. It's the least squares regression line, but it's sort of the best fit line is suggesting it's nearly horizontal, which, which suggests that there's almost no relationship at all. Um, so yeah, not, um, not very useful at all. And, but I decided to present it anyway, because sometimes you have these ideas that maybe two things are related. When you look at the scatter plot, you're like, yeah, I guess not, and then rethink it. But you know, of course, I'm not, um, I'm not in the medical field, so I really wouldn't know how height and pulse are related. Uh, all right, and then I have another example of a scatter plot. Here is a relationship, and this is a very obvious relationship. This is between the span of the writing hand, which means sort of the width of your writing hand when it's spread out, and the span of your non-writing hand. And as you can imagine, you would think that the spans of your two hands would be similar, um, and in fact, they are quite well related, as you would see the best fit line um, offered offered in the center. Um, um, one thing I did want to talk about was uh, explanatory and response variables. Um, just going back, you know, when I said that I thought maybe height would explain pulse, that would be that the height is an explanatory variable and that the response that the uh, pulse is a response. Some people call this independent and dependent variables. Um, but here, I would have no reason to think that the span of your writing hand would explain the span of your non-writing hand in any better way than the span of your non-writing hand would explain the span of your writing hand. So in a sense, they're just sort of associated or correlated. Clearly, there's a good size correlation between these two. So just an example of a graph of two quantitative variables. Um, if you had one categorical and one quantitative variable, you could do side-by-side -side box plots. And here I've uh, shown how gender, uh, male and female, might be able to explain height. Um, and so, yeah, males uh, are, tend to be taller than females, and so this is something I already knew. And so I was able to see it sort of right away. And what's interesting to note is that the males, not only are they taller generally, but they have a much larger spread of height. 
um, than than females, and you can see that pretty clearly, pretty clearly in this graph. Um, um, and then lastly, if you have two categorical variables, um, really the best way to look at the relationships there is not a graph at all. Again, it's a table. And here, I'm looking at handedness, so whether you're left or right handed, versus how you clap. with the left hand clapping on top, the right hand clapping on top, or neither? And um, these are conditional percents. And so we have the count in each of these. But since there's so many more right-handed people, there's 217 right-handed in the sample versus 18 left-handed, we can't use the counts to help us see the association. We need to use conditional percent. And we're going to condition on the thing that we, on the variable that we see as the explanatory variable, and in this case, handedness. So of the people who are right-handed, we see that 60, almost 66% of them uh, choose to put to clap with their right hand on top. But of the people who are left-handed, only 22% of them clap with their right hand on top. So they're much more likely to clap with their left hand on top. And so there appears to be an association here. And you need to use these conditional percents in order to do that. Um, all right, so that's the two categorical variables. And one other kind of relationship variable that has a particular name is a time plot or a time series. And this is where time is on the x-axis, and then you would have your other um, quantitative variable on your y-axis. In fact, in this graph, there's two different variables, quantitative variables on the y-axis. Uh, the blue is the, <coughs> this is US, sorry, the, the title really, I'm not too happy. I didn't make this graph. I just pulled it off of a Wikimedia Commons as an example. And um, but the title doesn't do it for me, uh, but it's tuberculosis incidents in the US from 1953 to 2009 was the title in Wikimedia Commons, but not the actual title on the graph. And you can see, uh, you know, anyway, um, so you can see the rate per 100,000 cases, and then you can see the percent change over time. So, uh, yeah, so that's really, that's the end of my slides. I've not left any time for questions. Wow, uh, I did not think that this would take so long to sort of work through it. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions that they want to ask here in the last few minutes. Allison, I was just going to say you you actually answered um, them as you went along. Um, so uh, John had a question I was going to ask, but he he actually um, when you got to the when you talked about correlation, I think that took care of his question. So uh, you, you you did well. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I really didn't expect it to go so long, but uh, you know, hope it was helpful. No, I think your your graphs were were excellent and uh, was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to turn off the recording, then we can keep. Going.